before I uh, do that, I'll just uh, uh, say a couple of words about Flow. So for those of you who attend for the first time, Flow is a seminar series on federated learning, broadly construed. So we host speakers on a broad range of topics from machine learning to distributed optimization to privacy, crypto, or efficiency. So if you have any suggestions for speakers, please uh, feel free to send them to us. Two quick administrative things. So if you have uh, questions during the talk, please write them in the chat or raise your hand, and then uh, we will unmute you when there's a good uh, time uh, for, for the speaker to answer your question. Second, uh, you'll probably notice this when the talk is being recorded. So um, uh, with that being said, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, introduce Song Han, who is very, ni very ni nice enough to uh, uh, accept our invitation. He's an associate professor at MIT ECS. He uh, received his PhD degree from Stanford University, where he, in, like, for his thesis, he introduced, I think, the first modern instantiation of uh, model compression techniques, which would apply to the scale of deep nets. His work, which is, I think, uh, usually called uh, deep compression, uh, includes pruning and quantization, and it is essentially, uh, it became a standard for efficient AI computing, and it was backed up by an efficient inference engine, which um, became like one of the key works in uh, sort of hardware where um, efficiency uh, on, on for modern AI. So then he followed up with, with a lot of additional and interesting research. I will, uh, I will not have the time to discuss all of it uh, in this uh, brief introduction, but I think um, his main... Um, um, his, his sort of main research thrust has been on tiny ML, essentially bringing deep learning to IoT devices. Uh, for for this, it has been recognized by uh, like with, with a, a lot of uh, um, sort of uh, prizes, awards, uh, and and so on. So he's uh, one of the thirty five under thirty five by MIT Tech Review, and he's uh, sort of received recognition for pretty much every um, sort of uh, every every um, uh, company. Well, like in terms of fellowships and so on. So I will um, kind of stop here with, with his introduction. I'm really uh, looking forward to uh, his talk. Okay, thanks, Dan. Appreciate the kind of introduction. Uh, I'm glad to talk about tiny ML and on-device learning, uh, the work from our group in the past uh, real four years. So uh, recently, uh, deep neural networks are pretty big. So we always have the dream to be able to deploy uh, these pretty big and powerful models to edge devices. So from cloud AI to mobile AI to tiny AI. Um, so the, the actual resource from cloud to tiny uh, is actually a huge gap between the supply and demand for computing, um, where a GPU uh, may have 80 gigabytes of memory, while an IoT device uh, may have only a certain uh, 100 kilobytes of SRAM on chip. So how do we bridge the gap and, and make neural networks much more efficient and co-design that with efficient systems to support both inference and training? And we hope today's large model will be tomorrow's tiny model with the co-design of systems and algorithms. So there are several advantages of tiny AI and the motivation for uh, tiny AI is that there are already billions of IoT devices around the world. Some of them are based on microcontrollers. They are very low cost, very affordable, and very low power. In particular, uh, be able to customize the model on device without having to transmit the data to the cloud uh, can preserve users' privacy. But a question we want to ask is whether gradient is safe to share. For example, uh, different workers compute on the same model. Uh, they have their own data. They do back propagation uh, with their data locally without having to send the data to, the, to each other. But they can exchange their weight or the, different, the diff of the weight is basically the gradient. But is the gradient uh, safe to share? For example, here we have two workers. One is training on its own data, the cat. The other is training on its own data as well, the dog. Um, and they have uh, can compute the losses, calculate the gradient, and they, can they share the gradient without leaking their data? 
so uh, researchers have find uh, it's possible to leak some of the information, some of such as the membership, whether a record is used in the batch or the property, whether a sample contains a certain uh, property. But can we do a more aggressive um, a leakage from the training data by observing the gradient. And we find actually sharing the gradient is not safe. Uh, we can um, leak the information uh, from the gradient. The gradient actually contains a lot of information. The larger the model, the larger the gradient because the gradient dimension is the same as the weight dimension. And the larger the model, the more likely the gradient is also containing a lot of information. So let's see animation here. Um, this is a normal training given the image. Um, we know the deep learning model, getting the prediction, calculate the loss according to the label, and then calculate the gradient. So the attacker can initi initialize a dummy input with a dummy, dummy label. It can be purely random. Okay? And based on the random input and random label, Given the model, they can predict, have a, a, a dummy prediction. It, it may also be random. And then we can calculate the loss. Uh, from the loss, we can calculate the gradient. Okay. Since these two models are the same, uh, we, can call, we can try to minimize the loss between these two gradients. Try to match the gradient of uh, this attacker's dummy input and dummy label. Okay, with the original image and the original label. Okay, try to match the gradient. And then we back propagate this loss between the two gradients to the input to the dummy input and dummy label. Okay, try to optimize the input and label such that the gradient can match. Okay, and try to see if we can steal the input. And here is another way uh, to uh, view this process. Uh, this is the figure in the paper. Given a normal particip participant and a malicious attacker on the bottom, they both have the same differentiable model, have a prediction, have a loss, and they try to uh, try to match uh, the gradient. Okay, try to match the gradient, and um, the loss here is a two uh, two gradients difference. Okay, try to match, minimize this difference, and back propagate the difference to the original input and to the label. And gradually, after a few iterations, we can see the law of the noise can be gradually recovered as uh, input. Okay, so it means that um, although only gradients are shared between malicious and attack uh, malicious attacker and normal users, if they have access to the original weight, it's actually possible to leak the original input from uh, the gradient. And let's see some examples. So this is a tag on vision model. Um, this is the ground truth, which is a table. And by a, a couple of iterations of deep leakage, we, we find it's actually possible to recover uh, this table. Okay. And let's see um, another example. What if we have multiple images? So this is batch size um, uh, with a larger batch size. And then uh, after a few iterations, we can still attack the leakage, uh, the images. The order is different, but you can see uh, the monkey is still here, the bike is here, and this is the bus, and this is the tree. So it's still possible uh, to find such deep leakage uh, phenomenon when we have a batch of images. A discussion here, as the resolution gets larger, um, the attack will be more challenging because here you are like having more uh, variables to solve given the same number of equations. Okay? On the contrary, uh, if the model is larger, um, it's easier to, uh, to have this deep leakage um, uh, uh, for a phenomena because it's like you have more equations with the same number of variables. Right? So that's some of the observation for vision models. What about for NLP models? So we try to find this deep leakage for BERT, the mass language model. So iteration zero, we can see the uh, the sentence is completely random, uh, random words. 
after 20 iterations, it begins to make sense. Registration, uh, volunteer applications, at the student travel. Some of them are still wrong, okay? But after uh, 30 iterations, it's very similar to the original text, which is coming from the uh, uh, New Rips website. Uh, registration, volunteer applications, and student travel application open the first week of September. Childcare will be available. So exactly matches the uh, original text, showing that it's possible to have this deep leakage uh, from NLP models as well. And let's see if we have some uh, defense strategies against deep leakage. So we tried a couple of ideas. Um, the first idea is to add uh, Gaussian noise, right? So um, this is the uh, gradient match loss. And so we can see um, from the original, uh, the loss is pretty low. And as we gradually increase the uh, Gaussian noise uh, to purple, um, there is no leakage. However, as we add the Gaussian noise to 10 to the minus 1, um, the, uh, the accuracy is also uh, hurt, significantly hurt. Okay, it's less than 1% uh, accuracy. So the model is barely usable compared with the original model's accuracy is like uh, 76%. Okay, so we tried both Gaussian noise um, and also the Laplacian noise and find indeed as we increase uh, the noise, the um, defendability gets better. Okay, If you have a strong noise, you can fully defend without having to leak, uh, leak anything. However, the original model's accuracy is greatly hurt, like only 40%, only less than 1%. So simply applying noise cannot prevent such deep leakage, okay? unless we allow significant uh, loss of accuracy. Uh, what about quantization using uh, low precision? So actually, uh, FP16 or Bfloat16 cannot uh, protect it. Well, in A, it can protect the accuracy. The performance drop is actually uh, pretty significant in this case. But this work was like in uh, four, four years ago, I believe with the uh, latest update of quantization methods, it might be possible to have better um, in aid accuracy while uh, protecting the leakage. So this is the comparison of um, another approach, okay, using uh, gradient compression. Okay, so gradient compression is from the paper uh, deep gradient compression, where we can uh, prune the uh, prune the gradients. Okay, so that we have less. Uh, it's like we have less equations, but the same number of variables. We can set some of the gradient to zero. Okay, uh, so that we it can reduce the communication bandwidth, and in the deep gradient compression paper. Uh, we find that we can reduce a lot of gradient, uh, almost only, leaving only 1% of the gradient. Okay. So as we uh, prune more gradient, um, for example, if we prune 50% uh, or prune away 70%, there is no leakage. And it's very safe to prune away like 70% of the gradient, even 90% of the gradient without losing the accuracy. So um, gradient compression or gradient pruning is a very, uh, is an effective method to prevent uh, deep leakage. So uh, the conclusion is that sharing gradient is as dangerous as sharing the original uh, user data, uh, especially with large model and small resolution. So the method is actually really uh, easy to implement about, about 20 lines of uh, PyTorch uh, implementation, just try to match. Uh, the key takeaway is try to match uh, the gradient and back propagate the gradient to the original, uh, to the dummy input, the dummy data and the dummy label. And has a pretty significant amount of citations since 2019. It'll be intriguing to see the performance of such method in the context of modern uh, large language models. Okay. And the website and GitHub is available. You really try it out.
I saw a question here from Dan. Uh, yes. Uh, so, I mean, um, is this a good time to ask questions, or because it seemed like you were um, sort of um, and like you you were done covering the deep leakage from gradient? Um, yeah. I, I just had. Uh, so, I think you mentioned that larger gradients are kind of easier to leak, and you showed this example with multiple images. Is that what you meant, or like? Because if you have a larger batch size, then you have more leakage, or uh, or is, does does the decoding get faster? Uh, so the conclusion is the larger the batch size, the harder uh, to leak, and mm -hmm. the larger resolution, the harder to leak because it's like you are trying to solve a lot of equations. Mm -hmm. and you have several variables, so the number of equation equal to uh, the, the dimension of the gradient tensor. Right, you have this yeah, amount yeah, of yeah. can match, so that's the degree of freedom, the number of equations, and the number of images to recover. The more, the harder, because the same number of equations, but you have more number of variables to solve, yeah. so it's harder. Uh, okay, so sorry, I, I think, then I think I misunderstood. I, I, so, uh, one maybe one question that I think would be relevant to the audience is that what happens if you I'm 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 not sure if you're familiar with federated averaging or something like uh, um, uh, local SGD, where what happens is that you, I mean, I guess you, you, you've you seen this so far. So the question is, could you do decoding with respect to essentially sums of updates as opposed to a single gradient? Yeah, I think that's a good method because um, it's like you have less number of, uh, less number of equations and the same number of variables as mm -hmm. So the rule of thumb is basically uh, reducing the number of uh, equations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that I mean that might that would be kind of interesting to interesting to see. Um, I think uh, ah yeah, and my my last question was uh, just a very minor. So uh, I imagine for a deep gradient compression, you're using error feedback. So you're you're not just sparsifying the. Uh, setting the gradient entries to zero, but you're also feeding back error from the previous steps. Is that correct? Right. Uh, the error, uh, local error accumulation, we have to do that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically, that that could also mess up the like the attacker's understanding, right? Because there, there's some kind of weird mix uh, mm -hmm. in what is being sent, right? Right. It's, it's not just like the current screen. point. Yeah. Not only the current run. But also the gradient contains the gradients from the previous rounds, the residuals that were error due to the pruning. So that's a good mix of mm -hmm. the current info and the previous info. It's like the equation is not only the current equation. So mm -hmm. that's another reason uh, why uh, gradient pruning can potentially help. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the clarification. Yeah, that's actually a very interesting insight. Thanks, Dan. All right, so um, let's Sorry, see. there is one question from the audience. Let me try to unmute Shingu. Okay, how about the dummy input generation method at the first step? So the dummy information is initialized at a random. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. Okay, thank you. So uh, how about other uh, generation methods such as based on the data distributions and uh, is better for this method uh, at first step? The uh, it's initialized at the random, so we yeah. didn't consider any other complicated methods. It might be possible to do that, but you have no prior, so we didn't take any prior into consideration. It's just randomly initialized, pretty strong assumption. OK, I see. Thank you. Assuming we know nothing about the input. All right. Um, so let's see. Um, exchanging gradient among different uh, learners might be um, not safe due to the deep leakage. What if we put everything uh, on, on the edge? You don't transmit. The data to the cloud, neither do you transmit the gradient to the cloud. But can we just learn locally, pure locally, and put everything on device, right? We can protect the privacy with smart home, personalized healthcare, right? And also, um, some places have 
poor connectivity, like precise agriculture, pretty large farm, and also ocean sensing down to the uh, sea. There's no physical connection to the internet. So um, we don't have to, uh, what if we can run everything for including back propagation updates locally on the device? But that's pretty, um, pretty challenging because here we see the uh, memory from uh, these edge devices is two or three or four orders of magnitude smaller than these mobile devices, and not to mention the cloud devices. So basically, the largest one is already 80 gigabyte or even more than 100 gigabyte, right? Uh, so it's pretty challenging, but still we try to squeeze the whole back propagation and, and update on the edge device. So we don't have to transmit anything or sacrifice the privacy. So let's see um, what is occupying this 320 kilobytes. In order to fit this 300 kilobyte, we wanna see what do we have to fit. So there is the memory, uh, there is the storage, um, and we can see there are roughly two categories. There's SRAM, which is readable, readable. There's DRAM and flash, uh, which is read only. Um, so the uh, flash is basically storing the kernel. We are assuming it's a microcontroller, uh, which is uh, read only. You don't have to write uh, in the inference case, but you have to write in the um, update uh, during the uh, training phase. Okay, so then you have to fit those weights that is going to be updated in the SRAM, which is readable and writable for both the input activation, output activation, and also the updated kernels. So uh, we try to see what is the bottleneck here. Um, we need to reduce both the weight and activation because we find uh, this traditional uh, neural networks, right, from ResNet to uh, mobile net, okay, from this color to this color, the parameters actually reduce by a lot, okay. Um, so the parameters, uh, megabytes from ResNet 18 to mobile net v2, 0 0.75, we put them together because they both have about 70% image net top line accuracy is reduced by eight, four, uh, more than 4x. However, the peak activation didn't decrease to our surprise. Actually, the activation, um, the amount of activation actually increased by uh, 80%. And the reason is due to the inverted bottleneck layer, uh, which is super inefficient with respect to the um, activation memory. Uh, there is an expansion ratio, which is six times, which enlarged the number of channels by six times. Although it's using the depth wise convolution, reducing the number of flops, but flops is cheap. Memory is expensive. We need to um, uh, try to maximize the flops per second, the arithmetic intensity, and, and don't have such large expansion ratio and try to avoid that. So we can uh, reduce the peak memory that's going to be uh, bottlenecking the uh, SRAM usage. Since weight, it's easy, much easier to quantize everything is static. Uh, the activation will soon become the bottleneck. And dealing with activation is very important. So we designed MCU net. Uh, the primary design principle is that uh, after you tape out, tape out a silicon, right, which has a given amount of SRAM or a given, given amount of DRAM, or you want to co-design the neural network with during the silicon design. Uh, how do we match the weight at the, and the activation with the available DRAM and available SRAM and hopefully you know, match the memory hierarchy, right? So now we have the full control over uh, how much uh, parameter and how much activation that's going to occupy for the entire system while delivering the same accuracy. So here is 70% image net top line accuracy compared with the baseline, right? So MCU net has a smaller amount of weight memory and also much smaller amount of peak activation, which constrains the SRAM um, while deliver the same, uh, same accuracy. Um, so a little bit of history. Um, before this research, we have done a lot of uh, methods on compressing deep neural nets. The most popular method is a deep compression compressing existing model by pruning the weights and also quantize the weight 
to low precision, and we can uh, reduce uh, resin fifty by seventeen x. But this is mostly targeting the weight. Uh, as we mentioned here, activation is important for IoT devices, for SRAM, for rhythmic intensity. So here we are going to cover uh, three new work like MCU Net, V1, V2, V3 uh, for uh, tiny ML. V1 targets tiny image recognition, V2 targets high resolution image recognition for uh, object detection, et cetera. And V3 uh, switch gear from inference to training and talk about these training techniques on device training techniques and there are only 256 kilobyte of uh, SRAM. And all together, it will be combining systems and algorithm design. So today I'm gonna to focus on uh, the training part since it's this, this workshop, uh, this seminar is about uh, federated learning. I'm gonna introduce three techniques that enable on-device training under 256 kilobyte of memory. Uh, these techniques are sparse update, not only uh, not update everything, quantization aware scaling, how to use 8-bit to train the model, to fine tune the model, and tiny training engine that implement those above two ideas, turning those theoretical saving into measured speed up. Okay, so here are the main three main topics. I'm gonna start with a sparse layer and sparse tensor update. So again, let's first evaluate uh, why the training memory is much larger than inference. Okay, so because of we have to store those intermediate activations. So during forward, after we compute layer, we can throw away the activation. But during the backward, we need to use those activations to calculate DL over DW. Okay. So the activation also grow linearly with the batch size, uh, which is always one for on-device real-time inference, but for training, um, batch size make it even larger. Even with batch size of one, activations are usually larger than model weights, since we have many, uh, many layers. We have to store them all together. So training memory is the key bottleneck. Here we compare um, the memory uh, occupied by parameter versus the activation. Uh, activation is the main bottleneck, not the parameters. Okay, it's actually 6.9 times larger amount of activation um, compared with parameter during training, not the inference. And again, um, we find previous mobile models like mobile net, V2, uh, 1.4, we put them together because they have the same emission net accuracy. So it's apples to apples comparison. Focus is on reducing the number of parameters. You see here, the number of parameters are reduced by 4x um, or the flops, right? Um, but the main bottleneck, which is activation, does not improve much, only in, in, uh, decrease by 10% from ResNet to MobileNet which is a bit surprising when we just found this area and a little bit surprised. Uh, not many people in the community are actually pointing out uh, this problem. Uh, like mobile net should be a much more lightweighted, smaller than ResNet 50, but actually that's not the case. The training memory <laughs> um, is actually only 10% smaller than ResNet because lots of the efforts has been devoted to reducing the flops and reducing the parameter size but uh, the activation size is ignored. And the key reason, as I mentioned, is due to the inverted bottleneck layer, which has a super big expansion ratio, six times, which uh, greatly enlarged the number of channels. And that doesn't quite hurt flops because it's stepwise convolution. You don't, you have a, a one less dimension uh, with a channel dimension. Uh, it also doesn't quite hurt the uh, parameter, number of parameters, because again, it's stepwise convolution, but there's no free lunch and all the uh, overhead is pushed to the activation size, which is actually pretty big, almost as big as the Resident 50. So how do we reduce the number of uh, activations and make it lightweighted? And the key idea is to reduce the um, Number of intermediate activations we have to we have to save, right? 
because we have to uh, throw the activated uh, updated weights in SRAM uh, since the microcontroller flash is read only. But assume SOC, that will be, you have more degree of freedom, you also have a DRAM that is, uh, that is writable, right? But again, the higher the memory hierarchy, the more expensive. So this is the baseline when we are updating all the layers. Uh, this is the memory cost, this is the top point accuracy. A popular approach uh, is to only update the last layer, which is a special case of our proposal, sparse layer, sparse tensor update. Let's start with something simple. Can we skip some of the layers? And the extreme case would be skip everything in the front and only keep the last FC layer. And indeed, that can reduce the training memory by 12x, an order of magnitude. However, there is significant accuracy degradation on the downstream task. It's simple, but hard accuracy. And in another paper called uh, uh, Tiny TL, Tiny uh, Transfer Learning, which we published in uh, NeurIPS 2021, we find um, if we also update the bias of all the remaining layers all the way to the front, actually we can drastically increase the accuracy from uh, this, blue, uh, this yellow part to this blue part. There is a still a performance gap, but it's a lot better, a lot better than um, updating the last layer only. And the memory cost is almost exactly the same as updating the last layer, okay, which is really magic. You get most of the gain uh, without having to put any um, sacrifice, any uh, memory overhead. And the key reason is that calculating the bias, okay, mm -hmm. only updating the bias part don't have to store those activations, okay, due to the chain rule. Um, and only updating the uh, weight requires uh, the activation, okay? Updating the bias doesn't require uh, storing the activation. So we can back propagate all the way to the first layer by updating the bias without having to change any weight, okay? Which is a pretty smart and effective method provide enough model capacity for you to have the degree of, degree of freedom to change the bias, but you don't have to store an activation. So um, guided by this paper, Tiny TL, Tiny Transfer Learning, uh, we wanna develop a general approach, um, which layer should be updated, whether we should update the bias or the weight or the partial weight. So that becomes the sparse layer, sparse tensor update. Okay, so the updated synapses are sparse. As we see this figure, from a newborn child to adult, uh, the number of synapses first grow from 2,500 to 15,000. And then during adolescence, the synapses are getting sparse. This is also during the K-12 education. You can think about it as like fine tuning the knowledge you learn from the first 10 years of life. And then the number of synapses, synapses decreased to 7,000 synapses per neuron. So this pruning process naturally happens when humans are actually learning most of their knowledge in their life during K-12. So we try to figure out which are the important uh, layers and weights that we should update, okay? So uh, we plotted both um, the accuracy and also the overhead. So here is the overhead, which is the memory, okay? Um, this is the number of layers from zero to 40. And then uh, we, we find that the activation in yellow actually is pretty high for the first couple of layers due to the uh, higher resolution. And the weight memory for the later layers is larger because they have larger number of channels and, smaller resolution, so activation is not much, um, not quite large, but the weight is actually uh, pretty big. Which means updating some of the middle layers is a sweet spot, both the weight and activation is not too big, okay? So, um, so the uh, final sparse update scheme, we, we try to update all the way, for the bias, we all the way updated to the layer uh, 20, and sparsely update a couple of the middle layers, okay? A couple of the middle layers. 
since they have a small amount of, amount of, amount of activation memory and also a small amount of weight. Okay, and also sparsely updated partially some of the later uh, tensors since they are pretty crucial to the accuracy. And later we are going to discuss how do we uh, do sensitivity analysis to see which layers are contributing more to the accuracy. Um, so this is basically the sparse update uh, method. Selectively choose a couple of layers and um, selectively choose a sub tensor for a certain layer that's getting updated. So therefore we need to only store a subset of the activations. Say this is the original uh, dy, uh, d loss over dw, okay? And we need to uh, store the entire um, activation, right? But if we are um, updating only one quarter of the weight here, we need to up store only one quarter of the activation here and put the remaining part to be fixed. And how exactly do we choose which layer to update with respect to the accuracy, okay? So we uh, did contribution analysis for all the biases and we find actually uh, it's kind of getting plateaued after a certain layer, then we stop. We no longer update the bias before that. And for the weight by uh, update, we train, uh, fine tune each layer individually, okay? Just one, one, on, one on one data set and, and, and then observe the ac relative accuracy gain um, for updating that layer. So the first couple of layers actually have a negative effect. So of course, we are not going to update them. And for later layer, we see very regular zigzag pattern, which actually generalize across different data sets that the depth-wise layer is actually not learning much, okay? This is a very good news because depth-wise layer is really the super inefficient layer, very low arithmetic intensity, um, and also causing a large expansion ratio with a lot of memory uh, overhead, but actually not contributing much, actually sometimes contributing negatively to the accuracy if we update them. So for sure, we're not going to update the depth wise layer. The second point wise layer is also less uh, contrib contributing less compared with the first point wise layer. So we are going only going to update the first uh, point wise layer because the input channel here is six times smaller than the se second um, uh, second depth wise layer. Okay, so these two in insights actually can very well combine together from the overhead from the memory perspective and also from the accuracy perspective. We should update the first pointwise layer, first pointwise call. And for BERT models, uh, we find those middle layers actually are contributing more uh, to the accuracy, okay? Versus the late layers and early layers some, sometimes are hurting negatively to the accuracy. And here we decide to update the multi head attention and the first FFN because the second FFN will have a larger input channel, which lead to more memory. So those are some of the insights for C and, and, and transformers. And here we, we can see the accuracy here. Um, uh, these are different nets, like MCU net, mobile v 2 proxy NAS. And from updating the full model and updating the last K layers, including updating the full model, which is the upper bound here, uh, versus uh, update only the bias in the yellow versus sparse update here. Uh, we can have even better accuracy sometimes um, actually 7.5 times smaller uh, actual memory required to update um, these, these weights. So sparse update really helps preserving the accuracy while drastically reducing the um, actual memory required for training compared with the inference. So this is a big picture in summary that summarizes uh, sparse update. This is the full update all the weights and biases are updated. Last only update, only up, update the last FC layer. Bias only update. This is a um, lot of the low hanging fruit is actually here. You just update the bias for all the layer and the last layer. 
which can recover a lot of accuracy, but with with little um, actual memory overhead versus the sparse layer, sparse tensor um, update. That's going to smartly select the sub layers and sub tensors. For since the first step uh, point wise is actually um, good a candidate to update, and for the um, transformers. Uh, everything except for the second IFFN layer is a good candidate to update. So now let's switch gear to talk about quantization aware scaling. Okay, so quantization is very popular uh, for inference. Okay, um, um, so this is a full precision. Uh, this is a quantized uh, quantized model. In this example, only two bit. Uh, they are more efficient, but difficult to optimize because here uh, you don't have those batch normalization where batch normalization are all folded into the uh, uh, into the convolution layer. Um, and now we have to deal with a real quantization graph rather than the fake quantization. Okay, fake quantization is used for quantization where training on QAT. But for real quantization, we want to really deploy it on the on the silicon for on-device training. Okay, so compared with fake quantization, uh, for real quantization, all tensors are int eight for the input or int thirty two for accumulator, and there is no floating point units. Um, you can have the me measured uh, memory saving, but leads to optimization difficulty uh, because you have to deal with mix the precisions and you don't have uh, this uh, batch normalization. So naively turning from FD32 SGD to int 8 SGD, you get about 10% uh, degradation of accuracy averaged across 10 data sets. So what is causing uh, this problem uh, of uh, doing back propagation on a real quantized graph? Okay, we see input is int 8, Accumulator is in 32 at the bias, and the scaling factor is at P32, and you cast it back to in 8 as the output of this layer. Okay, And what is missing here? And why there is such a big uh, accuracy degradation? So we plotted the uh, weight over gradient. Okay, Since this is the weight over gradient in log ratio, uh, we can see a big difference between weight over gradient. Okay, IP32 used to be here, uh, very decent, but in Tate training, you have suddenly have a super big weight over gradient. What does it mean? That means <clears throat> the weight is too big, gradient is too small, weight over gradient is too large. Okay, and it has a zigzag pattern, which is different for the uh, weight and the bias, <coughs> and also for different layers. Actually, here and here can differ by like five orders of magnitude. So you cannot have a, a constant scaling factor to scale them. Okay, and why the scale of weight and gradient does not match in real quantized training? So we dig deeper uh, and try to see actually this can be fixed with only a, a single line of code. And let's see, uh, I'll review a little bit about quantization. Okay, so uh, in quantization, the weight and activation are both in int 8. The bias is in 32, so the accumulator is in 32. And then we have a floating point scaling factor um, to cast them. Okay, and for the output, we have to, uh, the scaling factor might be different for different layers since this int 8. If it's int 4, it might be different for different channels. And finally, we cast it back to int 8 as the output of this layer. Okay, write it in another way. The original weight, IP32 weight, equal to a scaling factor times the int8 weight. Okay, the int8 weight ranges from minus 128 to positive 127. Or the, or, but the original weight might be like two point something, one point something, a uh, uh, sm smaller number. So SW is usually uh, much smaller than one. Okay, keep in mind, SW is usually smaller than one. Projecting from minus 28, positive 127, to something like one or two, okay? So it's small, something much smaller than one. If we calculate the gradient with respect to the uh, to the weight, okay? Uh, according to a simple chain rule, it's actually SW times the gradient to the original 
IP32 weight. So this is really uh, the big issue causing the mismatch, okay? If we calculate the weight over gradient, which measures the relative big, uh, relative size of the weight and gradient, um, we plug in the weight, uh, weight hat, which is the quantized version, which is equal to the original weight divided by SW, so it is here. And we plug in uh, the GW hat, which is here, SW times this GW, and immediately we find there's SW to the power of minus two times the original weight over gradient. Okay, so this is really hurting the uh, weight over gradient ratio. And since uh, as we discussed here, SW is something smaller than one, SW to the power of minus two is something much bigger than one, okay? Causing uh, the quantized weight uh, getting much bigger that uh, weight over gradient much bigger than the original weight and over gradient. If that is a constant, we can simply scale the learning rate to make the gradient larger. However, the scaling factor is different for different layer. Even for weight and bias, those are different, okay? That's why uh, it's not easy to have a single, uh, can, we cannot simply scale up the learning rate. But the solution is pretty simple here. Since we know, uh, the scaling factor at compile time, this is something we already get after training the model, uh, we can just rescale the, the gradients, okay? And plug in this S to the power of minus two to the uh, gradient and similar to the to the bias. The derivation is very similar, uh, just there are two terms here. So there's just one line of code to correct back the gradient of the weight and one of code for the activation, uh, for the bias. So after such magic one line of code uh, of this quantization of our scaling, we can um, have this in a training plus QAS quantization of our scaling fully align the weight over gradient ratio compared with the P32, by P32. Now, which is pretty, pretty awesome. And after quantization of wear scaling, the QAS, we can observe the convergence becomes much better. Okay, This is blue green uh, versus uh, without QAS, which is in green, uh, which is in blue. For both the training logs and also the validation logs. And so now um, with QAS, we can bring back uh, the uh, accuracy. Is even better than methods like Atom, which incurs reacts extra memory storing those inter intermediate states, optimization states. And finally, we need to implement above algorithm innovations into measure the speed up. So we introduce tiny training engine, um, since existing framework cannot fit the two fifty six kilobytes of available SRAM. Tensor flow is taking six hundred megabytes. Uh, PyTorch is taking 300 megabytes, IMN is taking 40 megabytes from Alibaba. Uh, so auto diff at runtime uh, will incur low edge efficiency. Memory is also pretty heavy. A lot of intermediate and used buffers has to compute full gradients. So that's a limitation of existing frameworks. So tiny training engine actually computes the auto diff um, and do the execution in a different manner. So conventional methods uh, perform the auto diff at, at the runtime in red, okay? So focus on flexibility with the conventional training framework and auto diff is perform at runtime. So optimizations will lead to a lot of runtime overhead. So tiny training engine moves most of the workload from runtime to compile time, thus minimize the runtime overhead. Also enable the opportunity for extensive graph optimizations. So let's see this animation again. Move the workload from runtime to compile time. So here is the optimization pipeline, starting with a Python defined model, okay? And trace the graph. So this is the PyTorch uh, definition. You have a COM2D, and then we can uh, we construct a forward IR, uh, giving the tensor IDs. And then um, we compute uh, we uh, uh, at compute the backward IR at compile time, right? So given this um, count2D assigned to uh, register zero, 
And then we can basically expand it um, into three parts, uh, three, co uh, three count to these to calculate the forward and also the backward. Okay, for backward, we calculate the gradient with respect to the input and gradient with respect to the weight. And finally, the gradient with respect to the bias. Okay, so the backward IR is generated at compile time. And we do the graph level optimizations to support sparse layer, sparse tensor update. For example, this is the full update, dydx, dydw, dydb. Bias update, we set gradient needs gradient to be false. Okay, for the weight and only keep it for the activation and for the bias. And therefore, we can automatically remove unnecessary computations from the DAG via the dependency analysis and DAG code elimination. Sparse layer update, we can also set the gradient, need gradient to be false since the whole layer doesn't need to be updated. Only uh, the second layer need to be updated. And sparse tensor update, we for example, we update only half of the weight. We set need grad to be to be half. Okay. And here we can slice uh, 10 channels out of um, the uh, 20, 20 channels. Okay. Previously it was 20 by 10. Now we only slice away 10 by 10. So it can automatically remove the buffers of the pruned gradients from the computation graph. And here we are updating it with a partial uh, tensors update. So as a result, such a sparse update will result in a pretty significant reduction of the peak memory, like six to eight times memory saving compared with the full update with respect to measured peak memory uh, size. And then we also perform operator reordering in place update so this is conventional way to update the parameters, long uh, distance between calculation and update. And now we try to immediately release the buffer as soon as it's updated. And by reordering, uh, that can save another two to three times peak memory. And we did operator lifecycle analysis. Um, we can show that the, the memory footprint can be uh, reduced a lot by operator reordering. So the optimized operators, um, both the optimization scheme and also tuning those in individual operators using loop and routing, blocking, uh, those kind of optim optimizations all together demonstrate 21 to 23x speed up over TensorFlow Lite on microcontrollers, ARM Cortex M7. And finally, we convert it into executables that deliver lightweight, portable, and efficient binary. Much smaller memory and faster speed fitting microcontrollers. And we can perform on device training on a uh, STM32 microcontroller. Here is doing uh, the person a visual wake word to detect whether there is person or no person. Initially, the prediction is wrong. And later we can feed in the images to train it on the fly and train 1.8 images per second. <clears throat> so we fast forward a little bit after about 10 minutes of training on device. Here we have only 256 kilobyte of SRAM and one megabyte of flash, which is pretty small, small amount of memory, but still can train it on device with 1.8 images per second. And then now we can perform inference. There's no person. Here is a person can run it at three IPS. On everything is on device. Uh, we later actually generalize this method to other devices, um, to more platforms. Uh, on my uh, Apple M1 chip, um, Raspberry Pi, Qualcomm Snapdragon, DSP, uh, CPU and CPU. More details uh, will appear at Micro this year in Toronto in late October. So this is some of the, some of the saving for the forward and backward. I'll summarize a little bit. Um, the two work for inference are highlighted by MIT homepage. The training one is also highlighted by MIT homepage, delivering the customized AI 
um, on device. So you don't have to actually transmit the weight or transmit the data to the cloud. And we open sourced the MCUNet uh, Tiny Training Engine. Uh, so we opened a new course called Efficient Model AI. Um, all the materials, including slides and homework, will be available online. The first lecture will be this October, uh, will be this September. So finally, appreciate MIT AI Hardware Program for sponsoring this research. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. So um, I guess we can check if there are any other questions from the audience. So people uh, should feel free to raise their hand. Uh, meanwhile, meanwhile, I I wanted to ask. Uh, I mean, I think uh, before this uh, sort of last. Uh, chapter you were describing a version which only uh, updates biases right. uh right and you were you were kind of selecting uh, the subset of layers uh, i mean I, my my question was <clears throat> if um so i if i'm not mistaken i think updating just the biases would correspond to some kind of low rank update of the weights so uh i was wondering if this is kind of in any way related to uh, all of the stuff that's, I mean, kind of these uh, popular low rank adaptation methods, or like if, uh, I guess this was, your work might have been actually before, but I was wondering if uh, low rank adaptation might actually be sort of relevant to the type of the types of techniques that you're, you're, uh, you have implemented so far. Right, I think it can be understood in that way because you are like, I didn't think about it as a, actual bypass layer, you are just adding something on top of the matrix matrix mm -hmm. location, right? Yeah. And this is as a result of like... Uh, yeah, yeah, but the technically, like, since you're just adding this kind of bias factor, I think you can literally, you could, if you wanted to be fancy, you could write it like a, as a low rank, literal low rank update to the original weight matrix, because this is kind of added on top. So I think these two things would, would be somewhat... Uh, equivalent, at least in this very simple case. Right, I agree. This is a simpler version of bias on, uh, of low rank and actually perform super well. You can gain a lot of the accuracy benefits by such a very simple and effective. Uh, yes, in, indeed. I mean, this was uh, this was surprising. I mean, I was I was uh, aware of the work, but I, I, I hadn't realized how, how well it actually how well it works in practice. Uh, so yeah, maybe my my follow up question to this would be: uh, I mean, uh, a lot of people are talking about. Uh, I mean, the scale of the model has the models has increased by a hundred x if you go to LLM. So I was wondering if any of these techniques are kind of uh, relevant to uh, large language model uh, training, where I mean, in some sense, what happens is that the model size exploded, and therefore our GPUs are now kind of the end devices. So, <laughs> so kind of, um, I was wondering if if there's any, um, I mean, if if this is, I mean, th these techniques could just uh, be used to scale kind of uh, LLM training uh, on kind of regular kind of regular devices as opposed to uh, these kinds of IoT type of devices. Right, so scaling up the device and scaling up the model, we are both interested yeah. in that. So here are some results like on JSON, JSON, or, uh, JSON Nano GPU um, mm -hmm. showing the reduction and also <laughs> uh, in the micro paper we got accepted, uh, we're gonna show uh, OPT 300 the smallest version of OPT model can be fine tuned mm -hmm. on JSON Nano. Larger oh, model. Very nice. Very nice. Um, okay. Um, all right. I don't think there are any uh, remaining questions. So I think I will uh, close the discussion for now. Uh, thank you very, very much for uh, the very interesting talk. And uh, yeah, uh, see, see. Uh, I hope I see everyone else uh, for, for one of the next editions of Flow. Thank you, Dan. See you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.